Welcome to Africa's LSP podcast, where we explore the world of translation, interpretation, and localization, as well as connect with the language industry's top players. From language service providers to the businesses and individuals who rely on their services, we'll be delving into the challenges, opportunities, and trends shaping the industry. Join us as we discover the power of language and the impact it has on connecting Africa and the world. Brought to you by Bolingo Consult and hosted by Nat Kintela. Africa's LSP podcast is the go-to podcast for all things language in Africa. Greetings and a warm welcome to all our listeners. I'm Nat Kintela from Bolingo Consult. And it is my great pleasure to introduce a remarkable guest joining us today on Africa's LSP podcast. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to the man I simply call Paul Theory, a highly skilled freelance conference interpreter and a voiceover artist. Hi, Paul. We are truly grateful that you accepted our invitation to take us on the journey into the world of interpretation. Welcome and thank you for being here with us. Same here as well. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Right. Could you briefly introduce yourself to us? Oh, yeah. Well, my name is Kodjo Bogi Paul Thierry, and uh, I am from Cote d'Ivoire. I am Ivorian. I'm a conference interpreter. Uh, I do a bit of translation sometimes, but I'm also a voiceover artist. I speak French. I speak English, as you can hear me. And I speak Portuguese. And I speak a bit of Spanish. I started learning Russian, but, you know, I just decided to, you know, to put it aside for a while. But when it comes to the job, to the job I do, conference interpreting, my main languages are French, English, and Portuguese. So I combine all of them. I can do from English to French, French to English, English to Portuguese, Portuguese to English, French to Portuguese, Portuguese to French. So I've had the opportunity to travel, to um, provide interpretation services to many organizations, to many um, government institutions, as well like African Union, ECOWAS, um, some NGOs, some uh, civil society organizations like OneEP. Um, I mean, there are so many that I pretty much don't remember all of them. But, I mean, just to give you a sense of, I mean, the, the organizations and institutions I've been working with. So that's it. You mentioned your Ivorian, but I know you're currently based in Ghana. For how long have you been in Ghana? I have been in Ghana for almost eight years now. Wow, eight years. Yeah. Let me ask this. Why Ghana? I mean, have you permanently moved here? And should I take it that it's because the interpretation job is more lucrative here than in Ivory Coast? Oh, not at all. <laughs> okay. We can say partly, yeah, because of interpretation, but the main reason, the main purpose of my coming to Ghana was initially because of academic purposes. I came to study, yeah, to do my bachelor in translation, and later on, I would have started with a master's in conference interpreting. And how do you find Ghana so far? Oh, Ghana is lovely. Of course it will be lovely. You're making so much money here. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways. When you say you're a live conference interpreter, what, what does it mean? Well, a conference interpreter or a live conference interpreter, that would refer to the same thing. When you are a conference interpreter, you are there as a facilitator in terms of communication. You are trying to establish the bridge between two entities that do not speak the same language. One may be speaking English and the other one will be speaking French or Portuguese or any other language that you may know. So the conference interpreter is there to see what one of the entities is saying, he says it live into the language of the other entity that does not understand what is being said in the source language. He does not wait for the person to end, but he says it at the same time, we call it simultaneous interpreting. So he says it at the same time, at the same pace, and he conveys the substance of the message. Right. Can you... Paint to us a picture of your journey to becoming a conference interpreter. I mean, in a world where um, every child wants to become a surgeon, a lawyer, an engineer, and so on, 
what inspired you to pursue a career in interpretation? Oh, thank you. Actually, this is a nice question because it makes me, you know, go back a little bit to my to my childhood. You know, it all started when I was still a child. You know, I was going to school as any child. And in Cote d'Ivoire, I mean, the official language is French. But I fell in love with English. So after finishing the primary school, I ran one day to my elderly sister and I told her, Sister, put everything you know in English on the paper and give it to me. And she, you know, she drafted something on the papers, many words. I only remember one word, headscarf. I mean, not now of the list that she drafted out. So I was, I fell in love when people were, were going to church and, you know, in those um, bilingual churches, the pastor preaches in French and there is somebody standing by the pastor and he's interpreting into English. So I was like, wow, that's so nice. That's so, oh, I love this job. I, I'm sure that when I grow up, this is what I want to become. So that's where it started. So little by little, I was kind of more focused on English. So that's what led me to be one of the best in my school, you know, JHS, SHS. When it came to, you know, English, I was one of the best. So at a certain point in time, I decided to, to do my bachelor degree um, in translation and then get to do my master's in conference interpreting because there is no way without a bachelor degree to do a master's in conference interpreting. You need to have a bachelor degree first, no matter the field. So I decided to do translation since they are pretty much on the same family. So that's, that's, that's pretty much <laughs> the, the, in a nutshell what happened. Great. So you mentioned that you initially got a degree in translation yeah, before indeed. later getting a master's degree in conference interpreting. Yeah. I'm curious to know why you did not stick to translation but ventured into conference interpreting instead. But first of all, let me ask, interpretation and translation, are they the same thing? Well, <laughs> there is a pretty sharp difference between both of them. Interpretation and translation are very different, though they are of the same family. Translation has to do with, uh, you know, conveying um, a message or, you know, doing translation from English, for example, to French, but exclusively in a written manner. It is written. But when it comes to interpretation, it is vocal. You have to say it out with your mouth. That's the difference. So now back to my question about why you ventured into interpreting and not translation. Perhaps it's because you like talking more than writing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Oh, bro. Right, right. Oh, right, you're right. likely to, right? But, you know, I don't really like talking. But I love interpreting. My goodness. I myself, I don't even know the reason I'm so much so in love with uh, conference interpreting. Well, as I've said on the onset, it all started when I was seeing people, you know, interpreting, you know, the pastor's preachers and the other one takes it into English. So that's where it all started. So I find the conference interpreting job more fascinating than translation. Let me explain it. Interpreting, you have the opportunity to travel. You have the opportunity to meet new people during conferences, high-level summit, high-level conferences, and so on and so forth. You meet, um, you make new friends, um, and you, you discover new places. But the job of the translator actually is a pretty kind of, a, you know, is kind of alone. Uh, it doesn't move to go anywhere. It receives documents, it translates, it sends it back to the client, and uh, that's all. And I think that it's also time consuming. That's pretty much the difference. But I prefer interpretation because, you know, it's very exciting, more than translation. That's my opinion. Perhaps someone else may say something else. Well, that's your opinion, like you rightly said. But I'm very sure the translators listening would be pouring some nice words on you for describing their profession so nicely. <laughs> 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 more so because you're originally one of theirs <laughs> oh my goodness so to our listeners if you didn't get the sarcasm let me be quick to issue this disclaimer to our translators listening we strongly disassociate ourselves from this claim Paul has just made <laughs> if you want to pick a bone with oh him for goodness. describing your profession as boring I can actually show you his house <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry guys <laughs> On a more serious note, 
just like now, every time you and I talk about conference interpreting, you make me imagine this very exciting, out of this world job that I would really want to go into. <laughs> For others who are probably also keen to know what your job actually entails, can you take us into a typical day in the life of a conference interpreter? So let's say today is the beginning of a three-day international conference where you're working as an interpreter. Take us through your day. I mean, the pre, the during, and the post-conference processes that you, you personally go through. Yeah, indeed it is exciting. But perhaps at a certain point in time, you feel like, hmm, that looks to be a quite challenging job. Well, so let me, let, me, let me start from the beginning. First thing first. The company will send you a request to ask for your availability and it will send you the date of the, of the meeting, the venue, and so on and so forth, what the, what the meeting is going to be about. So when you confirm your availability, they will now send you the documents of the conference. So like generally like two weeks to the day of the conference, they will send you the document and you, the interpreter, it is your responsibility to prepare and make sure you are ready for the conference. So you go through the document, you read the terminologies, you make sure that you have a comprehensive understanding or knowledge of what it's going to be about, and you make sure that you have a glossary where you can write words, where you can write, you know, the, the words in the, both languages, the languages you are going to interpret in. So when it is the day of the conference, you go to the venue, you go to the conference naturally, at least 30 minutes before the time of the conference. When you get to the conference venue, you sit in your booth and you try to look at the interpretation device to make sure that you are aware of all the configurations that were made, which channel is French, if it is French, you are going to work with, which channel is English, if it is English, you are going to work with, and make sure that everything goes smoothly. So at a certain point in time, the participants will start coming in and they will sit and then they will start with their normal process. Generally, they have an opening ceremony where the keynote speaker will come and deliver the welcome address. They will speak, they will speak, they will speak. So after a whole lot of things, they will have a coffee break. You know, you go enjoy some snacks, you know, I mean, after the coffee break, you continue until it is about 12 or 1 p.m. where you have lunch. I mean, you just go and you choose whatever you want to eat, bro. Oh, man. <laughs> so when, when, when you finish with, with, with lunch, you go back and you start the session again until it is about like generally about 3 p.m. thereabout. You have another coffee break again and you go <laughs> enjoy some snacks, bro. Wow. <laughs> I think I now see the actual reason why you chose conference interpreting over translation. <laughs> yeah. So when you finish, you continue, I mean, until 4, 5 p.m. That's where the conferences generally end. And you go back home, just that you'll be very tired. Generally, first days are really, really challenging and uh, very energy consuming as well. But from the second day going, it becomes much more easier. Why is that, if I may ask? The reason is that the first day you have that pressure. That pressure that it's a new, perhaps it's a new field, it's a new organization, or a new um, topic, a new subject, or some, a field that you've never worked in before. Perhaps it, it may be about energy, it may be about, uh, you know, electricity or uh, surgery and so on and so forth. So once you get to the second day, you would have already gotten like much acquainted, much abreast with the terminologies, the environment, the people. So the level of pressure would have significantly decreased. So generally, that's, that's it. Interesting. So from all you've just said, I can deduce that being a live conference interpreter certainly requires exceptional language skills, yeah. quick thinking, as well as the ability to work under pressure. Mm -hmm. Now. How do you personally handle the pressure and still mm -hmm. maintain accuracy and clarity in your interpretation? Are there any strategies or techniques that you find particularly helpful? This is very key. Maintain accuracy in the midst of all this pressure. Now, let me start from, with your question. How do I handle the level of pressure and still maintain accuracy in my delivery? It's very key for the interpreter actually to 
make sure he have a good mastery of the pressure level. Because the people listening to you, they don't have um, any idea of what the, I mean, the speaker is saying, if not by you. So when you're delivering, they need to feel assurance. They need to feel that they can trust you, they can trust your delivery, and they can, you know, they can feel comfortable with you. So if you are not able to really master the level of pressure, it will be felt in your delivery, in your voice. So they will be like, you know, they'll be doubting, they'll be quite reluctant as to believe you or not. But what do I do personally? That's the question. Personally, when I get in the booth, I already have a frame of mind when it comes to interpretation. I am like, I am one of you guys. I am your collaborator. And I'm here to facilitate this communication because we all have a common interest. I do as though I am part of them and we are sharing the same challenges, the same issues, and we are here to discuss and to make sure that everything goes on smoothly. This is one. The second thing that I have in mind is that I'm a professional. Therefore, I am here to work as a professional. This will drastically reduce the level of pressure. You'll be so calm because you know you are a professional. You're not someone who is a carpenter and that though somebody went to take and put in the booth. Uh-huh. So you know that you'll be doing your job and everybody will be happy. So these are essentially the two things that are put in my mind when I go to interpret. Right. Still on the issue of pressure. I'm sure that as an interpreter, one thing that can put you under massive pressure is when you encounter moments of linguistic or cultural challenges in the line of duty. Mm -hmm. I mean, those awkward situations where there are no direct translations for certain words or concepts. (laughs) Now, How do you specifically handle such situations Mm -hmm. and ensure that you don't distort the interpretation? Uh, It it just performs a magic. (laughs) (laughs) I'm joking, I'm joking. (laughs) 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 Oh, yeah. I mean, such instances are commonplace, you know, in the life of the interpreter. Every time, I mean, you go for a conference, you are likely to come across such instances. That's why you ought to prepare go to the documentation, make sure you have a glossary and so on and so forth. But, you know, sometimes those um, participants can, you know, do some kind of digression. They will go and talk about something else. But that something else is not simple. It's so complicated and very full of terminologies that you're like, oh boy. But, you know, that's why it's good for you to have a good level of mastery of pressure. That will help you, you know, maintain your composure and mobilize all your cognitive resources in an optimal manner so as to give a nice delivery. When something comes across that you are, I mean, it comes as a bullet, just keep calm. Because if you are panicking, the one listening to you is likely to doubt what you'll be saying. Is he sure or is not sure what he's saying? So when it comes, you try, if you're not finding the right expression directly in the target language, You try and make sure you understand the overall idea of what the person uh, just said, the person's submission, and you just give it out. The main substance of what he said, sometimes it's not good for the interpreter to focus on words, but you should focus on the substance, the very substance of the message that was delivered by the speaker. Right, right, right. So I know your job is such that you're mostly Mm. always in a booth somewhere in the conference room and speaking into the ears of the participants through communication devices. Yeah. I wonder though, Mm -hmm. these participants that you interpret for, do they ever get to meet you in person? Yeah, generally during break, coffee breaks and lunch, you know. Sometimes they may even look for you because when they are like, they are really marveling at the job you're, you're doing and your delivery is so smooth and so excellent. Sometimes they can't help but try and see you. I mean, who is that guy who is speaking my ears and is making me understand what guy is saying in the, in the other language and he's doing his job so well? I've come across such instances where after the first session, we went outside to have coffee break and I was enjoying my snack as usual and a guy comes to me. I mean, it was a white man that day. He first asked, are you the interpreter? I mean, the guy was not smiling. So I was like, oh boy, did, did something, I might have done something wrong. So I said, uh, yes, but uh, my colleague is there. I mean, I'm not alone if there is trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's not me. It's <laughs> you know me? Uh, I mean, I said my colleague is there as well. So we are too. Because that guy who came to me, I saw him when I was interpreting 
he was looking at me. So when he asked, I said, I am the interpreter, but my colleague is there as well. So he stretched his hand out to me and he said, congratulations, you are doing an excellent job. So I was like, oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I can imagine how you felt. <laughs> <laughs> I felt so good, bro. It's always good. So just to illustrate what I was saying, I've given this example. So there are times where at the end of the conference as well, they may come to you and they want to exchange contact with you directly without you asking them to give you their number because they want to keep in touch with you. Because sometimes they may have some conferences in their countries or they may have some other events. They want you to provide them with your services. So sometimes that may be the reason as well. Wow. Interesting. So moving on to what it actually takes to be an interpreter. I read somewhere that you'd require an above average IQ to be able to be an interpreter. I don't know how true that is, but <laughs> with all that you've shared, I, I won't be surprised if that turns out to be a, a fact. Exactly, exactly. Um, now, aside from having natural traits such as intelligence and a knack for languages, what steps do you take to further develop your interpreting skills? And um, what are some resources you would recommend to aspiring interpreters? Okay, so to strengthen or to build your skills as an interpreter, well, I would say that one, one is born an interpreter. I mean, because to a certain extent, it's like an, an inborn ability or capacity, but which has to be developed. Because I know some very good interpreters who's never been to any school of interpretation, but who actually are very good at their craft. But I've also seen some that, you know, they actually went through the training, but they don't flow that much as expected when you compare them to the one who's never been to the school before. So it can naturally take us to the conclusion that, you know, it's a kind of something that has a natural inborn aspect. Now, in addition to that, you ought to work on a daily basis. You shouldn't be like, oh, I mean, I, I'm trying. I mean, what I'm doing is not that bad because it is a work that requires a lot from you. It needs you to be in contact with that language on a daily basis. So you ought to be listening to news. You ought to be listening to, to the radio, for example, to get abreast with the, what is making the headlines, you know, what is happening throughout the world so that you can be, you know, aware of the, the new words, terminologies, and so on and so forth. You ought to read a lot, and you ought to diversify the, the things you read about, the things you listen, the things you study, because the interpreter is called to cover conferences that cover a very large spectrum of domains. So read, listen a lot, practice that very exercise that, that's called shadowing. Uh, shadowing is the simple fact of uh, listening and seeing what the person is saying in the same language, with the same speed, the same intonation, and the same accent. So you try to do your best to do that, but do it on a regular basis so that you can have the mastery of the language when it comes to flowing, when it comes to, you know, you name it. So in terms of uh, other resources as well, we can go YouTube. Hashtag UNGA and you put the language you want and you have the list of all the speeches that were delivered by heads of states, by ministers, heads of government. And you can also have when you type hashtag UNGA and the target language, you can have the interpretation of the original speech. By having both speeches in two different languages, you can be a kind of trying to know, okay, this is how the professional interpreter said this. This is how he said this. And you can also practice. So you have speeches, you put on your headset and you practice. You interpret, you interpret, and you interpret. When you are, you are done, you can compare it to the, to the one who interpreted, the, the professional, you know, that he interpreted. So that you can know the techniques, the strategies that he used to make sure he delivers optimally. Nice. That's, that's some solid advice. Now, let's talk about the future of interpretation. I read an article posted last April on um, Orange's research and innovation website known as um, Hello Future. And the article was captioned, Translation Professions Doomed by Artificial Intelligence. Really? 
This article mentioned that in late 2022, uh, ahead of a launch of a new French video streaming service, an announcement was made by the service's captions provider that it's intended to use AI to automate the production of subtitles. This actually provoked an outcry among film and TV translators. And then ultimately, the plan was dropped um, in light of a press release issued by the Association of Audiovisual Translators and Adapters. My question is, what's your take on this? As an interpreter, do you think your job is at risk due to AI? <laughs> oh, the big answer would be a big no. Yeah, a big no. Because ultimately, the work of interpreting is essentially a human job. You don't understand what I, what I'm, why I'm saying it's a human job. Tell me, sir. Because, you know, when you are interpreting, you are conveying the message but your cognitive capacity helps you understand where the person is coming from and what he's driving at. Because in the process of interpreting, you use what we call anticipation. Anticipation helps you project and know where the person is going, or what the person is driving at. And there are certain subtleties of the language. Someone may be saying this to say that. In other words, the said or the unsaid. I hope, I hope you are getting what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the interpreter has that capacity of deciphering what is being said. But AI cannot get into those nitty-gritties and those subtleties because they are... It takes your word as it is. Yeah, exactly, because they way, take your word as it is. There are certain ambiguities of the language as well that are expressed. But the interpreter takes cognizance of the surrounding factors, what the person said, what he said before and what he said after, the environment that the person finds himself in and the context that the person took into consideration before saying what he said. So, I mean, there are so, so many things to consider that I'm like, <laughs> a machine cannot do that naturally because even your spirit as well helps you in the process. For those who are Christian, I would say the Holy Spirit helps you as well. Right. Let's go there, bro. Let's go there. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes you have to express the feelings of the person who is speaking. So the person may be speaking with a certain feeling of sadness, of uh, revolt, of uh, anger. And sometimes there are words that, are, that the person is using. You know, if you translate it and you interpret it in the target language, it's going to cause a kind of uh, disarray or, you know, um, trouble. So the interpreter will use his own discretion and know what is the word that will fit, that will be the best or to interpret this idea or message that the person expressed. So, I mean, if AI has to take over the work of the interpreter, there is still a long way to go. Interesting insights you've just shared. Thanks, Paul. So my final question to you before we leave. As an interpreter who has worked with major international organizations, what advice would you give to interpreters who aspire to work with prestigious clients or secure contracts with global institutions like you have? <laughs> oh my goodness. This is a very great question. You know, I put a premium on quality. There is a, a passage of the Bible that gives us understanding about this concept. If you allow me, I would like to read it. Oh yeah, please go ahead. Proverbs 22, verse 29. Right. Do you see any truly competent workers that will serve kings rather than working for ordinary people? Right. Other versions say, do you see one diligent in this way? Uh -huh. Exactly. It is, it is very clear. You know, if you are good at your craft and make sure that you are not a kind of lazy person, what I would give as advice, lay a special emphasis Put a premium on the quality of your delivery. You know, God gives us opportunities and it is our own responsibility to make sure that we use those opportunities and we we'll make the best out of it. You know, there is something that people usually say, oh, this guy or that woman is lucky. She's not lucky. Let me explain this. Luck, perhaps if you want to explain it, is the encounter between preparation and opportunity. 
The opportunity may come, but are you prepared enough to take the most out of it? If you're not prepared and the opportunity comes, you will fail and someone sitting under a tree will look at you and say, you are unlucky. Oh no, you shouldn't be part of that category. So make sure that you are prepared. God will bring the opportunity to you. So you, your responsibility is to take the most out of it. So once you're prepared and it comes, you will nail it and then it will take you to higher ground. Higher ground and higher ground. That's it. Oh, wow. What an end to an already amazing discussion. (laughs) It's been great talking to you, Paul. Mm. Thanks for generously giving us a tour of your world as a conference interpreter. You're welcome, bro. We really appreciate having you on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Like we always do, we will make sure to provide our listeners with links to your LinkedIn profile. Okay. So those who want to connect with you can do that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you once again for passing through Africa's LSP podcast. You're welcome. It was a great privilege for me, actually, to be on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Africa's LSP podcast. We hope you enjoyed the conversation and learned something new. For feedback or inquiries, reach out to us at podcast at bolingoconsult.com. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review us on your favorite platforms. Until next time, stay curious and keep growing.